Good evening, everyone. So, with this week, we'll, we are going to shift and discuss clinical topics now. Uh, we have covered antifungals in the past, and from this month onwards, at least I am planning to do at least three to four or maybe five to six videos on venereology or STI topics because these were the topics chosen when I asked everyone about uh, what should we uh, study next. So I thought that I will do a single single videos on STIs. There are major STIs like um, uh, HIV, syphilis, uh, genital warts. They, they will require multiple videos because they are larger topics. They are common dermatosis. They are common uh, topics uh, which are frequently asked in exams. So I thought I'll cover them in a lot more detail with multiple videos. In the meantime, I should cover the shorter STIs uh, what, like uh, chancroid, donovanosis, LGV, uh, candidal vulvovaginitis. So with that can be covered in a single video. It will be very easy to uh, to discuss those topics in one single large video. So from this week onwards, we'll, every week, every Saturday, we'll be discussing one topic from venereology. And this week we are going to start from chancroid. Okay. So chancroid, uh, as the name suggests, is it's called chancroid, which means it looks like a chancre. Okay. The root word oid means which looks like or which pertains to or related to. Okay. So since it's a genital ulcer and we have the uh, the name of the genital ulcer by syphilis is chancre and this looks like chancre. So it is chancroid. So that is the et etymology of this term. So without much ado, let's start a discussion on chancroid. Okay, so the first most common point, the causative organism is Haemophilus ducreae. Okay, so this is the this is a bacteria. It's a bacteria. It's a bacilli. That means the rod shaped bacteria. We'll discuss the biology of Haemophilus ducreae in uh, subsequent slides. So, uh, what's the definition of or what is the typical ulcer of a, of a chancroides? It's a, it is single or multiple ulcers. The ulcer is superficial. That means it is not much indurated and they are tender. Now, these two points are very important. Superficial and tender. This is different from a syphilitic ulcer. A syphilitic ulcer is non-tender. It's not painful. And a syphilitic ulcer is also indurated, which kind of leads to the Dori flop sign. Let me write it here. Dori flop sign. We'll discuss Dori flop when we'll be discussing clinical, clinical features of primary syphilis. Okay. So uh, these, these two are the differentiating features of a chancroid from a chancre. Okay. And chancroid is a non-indurated tender ulcer. These two points have to be mentioned when you are discussing a chancroid ulcer. It is associated with painful inguinal lymphadenitis which might proceed to form a bubo in about half of the cases. Now what is bubo? So if I just make a rough diagram of the inguinal fold, you have the superficial and the deep inguinal lymph nodes. And when these get inflamed, it becomes the inguinal lymphadenopathy. If the inflammation is a lot, it's, it crosses a certain threshold, there will be central necrosis in the lymph nodes and they will become a huge abscess like or a huge growth here. And this is known as a bubo. One thing to keep in mind is that Haemophilus ducreae is not isolated from the aspiration of, bubo, of this bubo. Okay. So there is no point in uh, culturing the bubo unless and until you suspect a secondary infection that has happened inside the lymph node. But if you are considering only as a reactionary, uh, not reactionary, but as a lymphadenopathy associated with Haemophilus ducreae, the organism is not isolated from aspiration from this bubo. Okay, let's move forward. So let's learn a bit of history and this is important if you are giving quizzes. So for quizzes, this is important. It was initially known as Alcus Mole. By Mole, we mean it is soft. Mole is the root word for soft. And why soft? Because chancroid is also known as soft chancre. And why, why soft chancre? Because it is non-indurated. Okay, it's not indurated. 
that's what's known as non uh, it's known as alcus mole initially the first term was Al alcus mole in the year 1852 now what this scientist or a bacteriologist augustus ducre said what he did was he auto inoculated the patients uh, forearm by taking the aspirate or you could say the tissue samples from the ulcers and was able to give the name or able to isolate the organism not isolate per se but to pertain that it's because of an infectious agent and he named the agent or the agent was named after Ducre as Haemophilus Ducre okay and just remember this photograph multiple times in quizzes they of, often show you a photograph to identify the personality so this is uh, Augusto Ducre the the organism was isolated by benzincom histopathology was given by unna you know the the best one of the best uh, histopathologists or dermatopathologists and ido was responsible for the intradermal testing which is not done now okay so just two uh, three points to remember it was initially known as alcus mole and uh, the description, the first description was by Augustus Ducre uh, of on on his name we got we get the name of Haemophilus Ducre, and it was isolated by Benzencon. The male to female ratio is about ten is to one, so it's very common in males and very common in in uncircumcised males because the prepuce gives a proper environment for the uh, organism to multiply and the ulcer to develop. And it might lead to persistence of ulcer because the patient might not notice it if it's uh, uncircumcised. Okay. And in females, the, the infection is more or less asymptomatic and it's in the deeper internal areas, internal like at the cervix or at the vaginal walls or uh, these areas. The ulcer can be hidden and thus uh, the, the epidemiology shifts a lot towards the male side. So you have the male to female ratio of NS to 1. The chancroid or the hemophilus ducre occurs only in human. There is no non-human reservoir in the environment or in the nature. So it multiplies inside a human host only. With the advent of uh, good antibacterial policies or good screening practices, and uh, remember that uh, uh, there are three, uh, there are five different kinds of genital ulcers, more or less. They can be multiple causes. But the five different types are syphilis and then you have herpes simplex virus or uh, genital, genital herpes. Then you have uh, chancroid, donovanosis, lymphogranuloma venerin. Okay. And in this, the incidence of HSV is significantly rising over the years. Followed by maybe the primary chancre of syphilis. But these three, chancroid, DV and LGV are decreasing in trend. In fact, if I remember one graph, it showed zero incidence after 2000. But this was US or UK, sorry, US uh, data. So the incidence has been zero for many decades now, at least more than two, de uh, two decades. Now, uh, what has happened, what the main reason could be is because of maybe increased uh, good practices regarding screening of various ulcer diseases and multiple times the drugs which is used to treat syphilis acts on chancroid also so if you give if you consider the syndromic management of genital ulcers and you treat it uh, treat any kind of genital ulcer with just a simple over the counter not over the counter but the simpler more commonly used antibiotics like doxycycline or, or azithromycin chancroid is also treated so maybe the incidence is not that much Additionally, chancroid may resolve spontaneously in few in uh, eight to twelve weeks. Okay, and so that could be another reason why the uh, the patient might never you know present themselves in the OPD, and the incidences can be uh, very difficult to measure and record. And that is why it is very difficult for me to find a good incidence of prevalence data for the Indian population because all the Indian population data is actually uh, in my opinion not uh, not giving the true picture. So you can just say that the incidence of genital ulcers has been decreasing over the years with the genital herpes being the most common cause of genital ulcers followed by primary chancre of syphilis. And uh, there has been increased incidence in the population suffering from HIV our C, uh, population who are CSW and even with homosexual exposures the uh, the chances of developing chancroid has been increasing over the years okay
it has been isolated or you could say that it is more prominent in the sub-saharan belt the central belt of the world the equatorial belt sub-saharan africa asia latin america so these are the areas where chancroid is much more commonly seen uh, especially in high risk populations like people with retrovirus positivity or csw or homosexuals okay let's move forward so if you're fighting a disease you need to know a bit about the agent so here we will discuss a bit about Haemophilus ducre. It's a streptobacillus. Strepto means it will be arranged in rows. Okay. And bacillus means it will be rod shaped. So here look, look at this image that I have uh, given it here. These are all rod shaped individual bacilli arranged in rows or a line. So it is streptobacillus with rounded ends. The ends are rounded here. Okay. Cleomorphic means multiple multiple shapes can be there. Slender gram negative. This is important to know. Gram negative because you uh, for, as it's a good screening test to do a gram strain from the exudate of the ulcer or a or a cotton swab taken from the edge and you might find gram negative uh, bas bacilli arranged in a row and you have a presumptive diagnosis of chancroid. But remember that there are multiple genital uh, bacilli or genital bacteria which might get easily confused with H. Ducre and you might be having a false uh, positive or a false negative diagnosis because of that. So it's a non-motile, non-spore forming bacilli. It is facultative anaerobic. Now, Haemophilus ducre is very difficult to grow in culture. It's very difficult to grow in, in, an, in a laboratory environment and it requires a certain set of conditions to be met while culturing it. That is why the cultures are also tough and most of it is, is, is a, it is grown on a blood agar. It requires hemin or the 10 factor for growth that is important. So uh, I think one question was asked in one quiz that uh, which of the STI, the causative organism of an STI requires hemin for growth. So that is also a one good important point. It converts nitrate to nitrite. It is oxidase positive and catalyst negative and thus show an alkaline phosphatase activity. So this, these are uh, majorly very important for microbiologists. What we need to uh, take away from this slide is that it's a streptobacillus gram negative uh, bacilli with rounded ends. And it, it is facultative anaerobe and requires certain conditions to be met while growing in the culture. And uh, this will be discussing in the subsequent slides. So here is a diagram not a, diet, a picture of Haemophilus ducre and you can actually see the Haemophilus ducre arranged in a row. Okay, so they are attached at the rounded ends one after the other. That's the streptol appearance and you have this arranged in thread like or rows. Okay, so you can see this row and all this row. So these are streptobacilli with rounded ends. Now, there are a few points that need to be kept in mind. One is the railroad track appearance, which is seen in tissue, in which what is there is just that, let's see if I make a row of uh, Haemophilus duke, right? Let's say it's like that. So, a railroad track appearance will be that they will be attached to parallel rows of Haemophilus duke, right? So, this is known as the railroad track appearance. On the other hand, the school of fish is like that they will be arranged in, you could say, a large elliptical body. Okay, so somewhat like a group of fishes or a school of fishes. And this can be seen on gram stain also. This can be seen on tissue culture plates also, majorly on the culture plates. And in fact, they can be up present as a cluster resembling a fingerprint so that that is also described so you have to remember that railroad track appearance is seen in haemophilus ducre or chancroid or schools of fish appearance is seen in haemophilus ducre or chancroid so these two words are used um, it's a uh, good quiz question or in mcqs can be easily asked that uh, what is the the uh, special name for the appearance of haemophilus ducre in various media so here we can see the railroad track appearance. Can you, can you see these two parallel lines going together? So this is railroad. Like It's like a railway track has been laid down. Okay. And uh, here you can also see somewhat of a resemblance of a railroad track. So this is, this is there. And here you can say somewhat like a school of fish. But I have better pictures in the next slide. 
In fact, this is the same picture that we had seen about two, three slides back. Let me just change the color of the pen. Yeah, so here you can see that it's somewhat of a railroad track appearance here. This Now, this is a very good railroad track appearance. Okay, you got the point? Now, this diagram shows the cluster of Haemophilus docri. Okay, let me just change the pen color. Yeah, so you can see the cluster of Haemophilus docri. It's like a group. And you can kind of uh, imagine a lot of fishes swimming in a group. And this is the school of fish. So this, this is known as the school of fish appearance. Okay, a school of fish appearance. So this is seen in Haemophilus ducre infection or chancroid. Clear? Let's move forward. Pathogenesis. <clears throat> now what happens is, uh, remember that Haemophilus ducre is an ulcer. Okay, it's an ulcer and because of uh, YouTube policies, I cannot uh, show you pictures of genitalia, but it's available in any of the books that you would be reading for your studies. Uh, let's just say that, uh, let me just erase it again. Yeah. Just, just a pictorial representation. So you have an ulcer at the glands. So what happens is that if you have a certain cut or there's any other areas of trauma or abrasion from which the bacilli can enter, it enters inside the skin layers, inside the tissue, inside the dermis, epidermis and everything. The minimal inoculum the needed is 10 raised to power 4 and it will cause an infection. Inoculum is the minimum, so minimum you know, colony forming units or the minimum number of bacilli to enter to cause an infection. Now what happens is when the bacilli enters inside the skin, it attaches itself to the cells by using its pili. Okay, so you have the rounded, uh, you know, rounded uh, bacilli, hemophilus ducre, and you have pili. And there are adherence pile, which are special kind of pile, and it attaches to a epithelial cell or uh, keratinocytes or the cells of the dermis, epidermis. So it attaches itself and then it releases hemolysins and cytotoxins. So cytotoxins will kill the cells and hemolysins will hemolyze the area. And this leads to cell damage. And when cell damage occurs at a macroscopic level or a macroscopic scale, it will eventually form an ulcer. So this is the pathomechanism of formation of ulcer. The bacteria goes inside, attaches itself to the uh, bacilli, sorry, to the uh, cells and then releases hemolysins and cytotoxins and causing cell damage. If the damage is severe, it causes an ulcer. And additionally, to kill the bacilli, what the body will do? It will call your immune cells. So these are all the T lymphocytes and majorly implicated players in this is CD4 and CD8 and out of that even the CD4 is the predominant immune response which is the Th1 type. So CD4 and CD8 positive T lymphocytes migrate to the area where, which is infected by Haemophilus ducre and then they start killing the bacilli and because of their immune mediated killing of the bacilli the damage is also increased causing an increase in the size and the formation of ulcer. Clear? Now this is how an ulcer is formed. This is for an ulcer. Now what happens is because of this kind of inflammatory activity, the, the local lymph nodes also get swollen up and that is known as chancroidal lymphadenitis or inflammation of lymph nodes because of chancroid infection. And it is mostly a pyogenic inflammatory response. That means the bacilli itself does not go to the lymph node and destroys the cellular architecture. It's that the infection at the genitalia is causing the swelling of the draining lymph nodes and it becomes uh, larger in size with central necrosis, pus formation and because of that it forms a bubo and it is an inflammatory response. That means even after aspiration of the contents, you will not be able to grow H. bucuri from the lymph node aspirate. Okay, so this is the pathogenesis. Let's move forward. There are certain virulence factors. For example, lipopolysaccharide, these are all parts of cell membranes of the bacilli. The pili, which is used for adherence by the bacilli to the epithelial cells. The extracellular toxins and majorly hemolysins. The hemolysins, the, the material that the bacilli secretes to destroy the cells. 
these are all virulence factors that means these are those factors which are responsible for the form the virulence or the uh, the amount of damage the bacilli can cause in humans the virulence the factors okay additional to that it has enzymes like superoxide dismutase and the function of superoxide dismutase is to get rid of reactive oxygen species and what happens is when you have your immune cells at the uh, at the place where it is infected by h duke right these immune cells will secrete some of the reactive oxygen species in order to destroy the bacilli and to counteract this mechanism the h duke has superoxide superoxide dismutase which neutralizes this reactive oxygen species so this is how it kind of you know uh, stays away from the immune cells and thereby increases the survival and the persistence of organism it also secretes hemolysin and as we have seen in the last slide hemolysin is responsible for formation of ulcer for the invasion of the bacilli and also immunogenic properties and since hemolysin is responsible for immunogenic properties it's a good candidate for vaccine against chancroid okay so i will not be covering the vaccines against stis i think i'll cover it in a separate lecture i'll cover vaccines against all uh, uh, stis so a hemolysin since it leads to an immune response it's a good candidate to manufacture a vaccine against it so that's what we are trying to say let's move forward okay so i have discussed the agent we have discussed the pathogenesis of h duke now let's start with the clinical features the incubation period is about 3 to 7 days after the exposure with an infected partner and in hiv it can be longer the incubation period will be longer because the immune mediated damage is not as robust as in a non retropositive individual so the incubation period might be prolonged in case of retropositive patients the uh, for but they mention the books mention 3 to 7 days now how it starts it will start with an erythematous papule okay it will just start as a papule and gradual gradually it will form a pustule okay so it will form a pustule and this pustule will undergo a necrosis it will undergo a central necrosis let me just make the necrosis part yes it will undergo a central necrosis and the necrosis will eventually keep on increasing 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 till it burst out and form a small necrotic tender bleeding non indurated ulcer remember these two words are very important a tender and a non indurated ulcer and the ulcer will have a ragged or undermined edge bleeding easily on touch now what do we mean by undermined edge so when this uh, will burst it will form an ulcer like this and this edge there is space in between and this is known as an undermined edge an undermined edge okay so this is an undermined edge so again speak with me it starts with a papule becomes a pustule with central necrosis and when that uh, that uh, pustule will burst it will form a small necrotic tender bleeding non indurated ulcer with undermined edges okay and it can have kissing ulcers or multiple ulcers kissing ulcers are when there are two surfaces in contact so because of auto inoculation because the bacilli will then uh, infect the attached part also so it will form multiple so it will form kissing ulcers that means two ulcers on up opposing surfaces it can also form multiple ulcers so this can be seen in clinically the ulcers can be so much so that it might lead to phimosis or paraphimosis in females the lesion might be asymptomatic or it may clinically present as mild vaginal discharge dyspareunia pain on voiding uh, which is painful urination or defecation because the ulcer is tender okay remember the ulcer is tender contrast that with the syphilitic ulcer which is non tender but indurated so it will be painful in the case of chancroid let's move forward in males the areas which are more commonly involved is prepucial rim that is rim of the prepuce the inner surface of the prepuce the frenulum which is the small skin attachment of the prepuce to the glands the coronal sulcus the pineal shaft or the anal orifice in case of homosexual exposures okay so these are the areas which are usually uh, which come into contact during uh, 
intercourse and because of that it can it, these are the most common sites of involvement in males in females it could be vulva anal margin or in fact as deep as cervical rim or the cervix auto inoculation is seen as we have discussed previously that uh, it is it is just the spread of disease from one primary lesion to multiple secondary lesions because of transmission of the bacilli the extra genital lesions are rare but they can still be present mainly on the oral mucosa or the other mucosal sites lymphadenopathy now lymphadenopathy is seen in about 30 to 60% of patients and it roughly takes about 1 to 2 days to develop it is unilateral in about 2/3 of the cases this is an important point and we'll discuss this important point when we'll be discussing donovanosis and lgv about 50% of this lymphadenopathy heals without any kind of separation or pus formation but 25% and it's a huge number 25% might go forward and the inflammatory activity or the pus formation is so much so that it will form a bubo in about 1 to 2 weeks okay so if you have a lymph node which gets swollen this is seen in 30 to 60% of patients takes about 1 to 2 days unilateral in 2/3 of cases 50% will heal without any issues while 25% can go forward and become a bubo okay so remember these data this uh, percentages it's a good idea to mention them while answering about chancroid or writing a short note on chancroid so one point of differentiation from chancroid and lymphogranuloma venereum is that the frequency of involvement and we are this, this we are talking about lymphadenopathy how to differentiate lymphadenopathy seen in chancroid and uh, differentiated with lymphadenopathy seen in lgv it's that the lymphadenopathy is seen about 30 to 60% of the cases in chancroid while it's there in 100% cases of lymphogranuloma venereum it's in the name okay so lymphogranuloma venereum it means that 100% involvement of lymph nodes would be there the incubation period for lymphadenopathy is about 7 to 12 7 to 14 days more or less about and but remember it starts about 1 to 2 days after the infection but can easily seen in uh, 7 to 14 days after the primary infection of the mucosa while in lgv the incubation period is larger it's about 10 to 30 days it's unilateral in 75% 2/3 of the cases while in it is 66.7% okay mm -hmm. the primary genital ulcers when the patient presents with bubo that means when a patient is presenting with a bubo whether there will be a primary ulcer present at that point or not so chancroid the ulcer will be present while lgv it won't be present remember the ulcer stage of lgv is very short lasting and might be, and may be asymptomatic so the patient might never present with ulcer while in chancroid it is tender it bleeds it bleeds easily so the patient will present with an ulcer The sinus formation is seen in single lymph node. There will be single sinus formation, while multiple sinuses are seen in LGV. Remember that LGV has a lot of complication because of fibrosis and scarring, and that is because of multiple sinus formation during the lymphadenopathy stage. There will not be any constitutional symptoms, any systemic spread, or any groove sign in chancroid. While in the LGV, they will be present, and the loculation will be unilocular in chancroid, but multilocular in lgv so i'll just remove everything uh, we'll remove this basic uh, markers from this slide so that you can take a screenshot and see the differences the differences between chancroid and lgv as far as lymphadenopathy is concerned just remember that it will be present in 100% of the cases in uh, lgv while it will be present in 30 to 60% of the cases in chancroid so this is discussion about lymphadenopathy in these two stis Okay so let's move forward complications in males the complications can be pelonitis which is inflammation of the glands as uh, uh, the phimosis paraphimosis because of scarring of the ulcer loss of tissue in phagedenic ulcer what is phagedenic phagedenic means phage means eating like bacteriophage okay So what happens in phagedenic ulcers is that the ulcer gets superficial, uh, uh, additionally infected by other bacterial species or other species like Fusarium and all, and because of that, the inflammatory damage or the damage by the other bacilli is so much so that there is significant destruction of tissue and it might lead to loss of tissue. So that is one complication, one of the complications of chancroid. The lymphadenopathy can form discharging sinuses and also multiple scarring. We have discussed in the last slide. 
Now, circumcised men are at a lower risk of chancroid. And in this study, this is this is line taken from this study that the individual risk ratios ranges from about 0.12 to 1.11. When the, uh, when the circumcision is considered. So what it means to say is that circumcised men have a decreased risk of developing chancroid. And that could be because of, um, let's say, keratinization of the glands or it could be because that the ulcer is now easily visible or quickly visible so they take treatment quickly. But I suspect it's because of the keratinization because that is how it will decrease the risk of chancroid transmission in a circumcised man. So remember this line, circumcised men have a lower risk of developing chancroid. So we have discussed about the clinical features and most of the time the diagnosis is made by clinical features alone. We have a tender, bleeding, non indurated ulcer over the glands, considered chancroid. Okay. Now how to diagnose? So whenever you are answering a question about how to diagnose in any STI infections, you have to go through all these parameters. First is microscopic, then culture, then PCR analysis, then antigen detection, antibody detection, and then histopathology or biopsy. Okay, so this is how you go forward. Yeah, so for microscopic, you take a cotton or an alginate swab. So the swab has to be cotton tipped or alginate tipped, and you take it from the edge of the ulcer. So remember, the ulcer has undermined edges. So you take it from this area, you rotate it inside the edge of the ulcer and then you take uh, you take it for staining and you use gram stain or GM stain. Remember that Haemophilus ducri is a gram negative bacilli. So you'll be able to easily see it in a gram stain. Now culture is gold standard. Remember that Haemophilus ducri is a very fastidious organism. It doesn't grow that easily. But if you are able to grow and isolate the organism, that is a gold standard. For any infectious disease, Isolation of the organism, the causative organism is the gold standard. Okay. So for culture is the gold standard and culture has to be done within four hours. Otherwise, the bacilli dies in the outside environment. So whenever you take a sample, make sure you transmit it to a microbiology lab within four hours and the culture is inoculated within four hours or you can store it for some time in a transport media. But it's remember, it's a very difficult to grow bacilli. So transport as soon as possible and start the culture. It requires temperature of 30, 33 degrees Celsius and with an environment of 5% CO2. And that makes the bacilli microaerophilic. Remember, it's a facultative anaerobic bacilli. So you require a certain uh, higher amount of CO2 in the, uh, in the culture media. Okay. The colonies are non-mucoid, raised, granular, grayish, yellow in color, but it's more important for the microbiologist. You just have to remember that culture is the gold standard in case of chancroid or in any infective cases. Now, PCR can be done. You 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 uh, isolate the bacilli by uh, by increasing the amount of the genetic material and finding out whether it belongs to H. ducri or not. And I would like to mention a multiplex PCR. Now, now what multiplex PCR does it? It tests for the three common genital ulcer diseases, which is chancroid by H. ducri, syphilitic ulcer by trapped by pallidum, and genital herpes type 1 and type 2 HSV strains. So what happens is that this is a single test which tests for three different causes, causes of genital ulcers. So you just have to take one sample, one test, and to find out what is actually is the cause of the ulcer is. Antigens like the outer membrane protein in the direct uh, direct formation of antigens or the like uh, LOS, which we have discussed as a virulence factors or the lipo. I am not able to remember the full form of LOS. Uh, I think it's lipoligosaccharide, but I'm not that sure. I've forgotten. But LOS and OMP are the agents which can be used for antigen detection. For antibody detection, it is not done because the tests are not available. They are not that good. So antibody detection is not done. And then we come to the biopsy. If we are very unsure and biopsy is majorly done when we want to rule out any kind of carcinoma or malignant changes. Okay, we see an ulcer which is bleeding and you want to rule out uh, malignancy. Biopsy is the choice. So remember in infective condition, culture is gold standard. In non-infective, biopsy is gold standard. Okay, I am not mentioning the uh, agars which I use because they are more important for uh, uh, microbiologists. Uh, 
usually if you're writing a short note on Shankar, it's a good idea to mention some agars. You can mention agars like Mueller, Mueller Hinton. I'll just mention it because I remember Mueller Hinton agar, Mueller Hinton agar and also a gonococcal, gonococcal agar base, agar base. Remember that this bacilli requires hemin to grow and hemin comes from blood. So you need to add some amount of horse blood to the agar so to provide uh, hemin. But it requires a 5% CO2 environment also. So it's a very difficult to grow organism. So remember, whenever you are discussing diagnosis of any STI, you have to go through all of these points. Microscopic, culture, PCR, antigen, antibody and biopsy. Okay. Now, biopsy for H. duca is very characteristic. Okay, it's a very characteristic biopsy. And uh, nowadays, we don't come across chancroid that often. And even if we come across it, we don't biopsy it. So, this uh, biopsy, uh, the, the description of the histopathology of chancroid is described in very, you know, older articles. So, what happens is the entire micro, the histopathological lesion is divided into three parts. You have the surface zone, the middle zone, and the deep zone. The surface zone just show an abscess and necrosis. Okay. So, and whenever there is necrosis, whenever there is pus formation, you will have neutrophils. So, there will be a narrow surface zone. The first zone will be narrow, narrow neutrophil zone with a lot of fibrin, blood cells, and necrotic tissue. Okay. So, N for narrow, N for neutrophils, N for necrosis. So, first is necrosis. This is the surface zone. The middle zone will have blood vessels. It will have newly formed blood vessels, endothelial cell proliferation, thrombosis, and even vessel wall degeneration. So the middle zone is related to blood vessels. Remember, the ulcer of H. bucri bleeds very easily. And where does the, all the blood come from? This kind of vessel proliferation. In deep zone, you have inflammatory cells like plasma cells and lymphoid cells. So, repeat after me. You have three zones of biopsy from top to bottom. The surface zone has neutrophils, necrosis. It's a narrow zone. The middle is uh, blood vessels with endothelial cell proliferation and degenerating vessels. And the deep zone has inflammatory cells like plasma cells and lymphoid cells. So, this is the oldest, uh, not the oldest, but this is the major reference that I could find. And this is from the year 1987. Okay, so here you can see the A part, which is the narrow zone, the narrow necrotic zone, neutrophil rich, fibrin rich, necrosis. Then you have a broad middle zone. Okay, you have a broad middle zone. And it is, uh, if you see it clearly, you can see this proliferating blood vessels. These are all blood vessels, you know, linearly arranged slit like blood vessels, so proliferating blood vessels. And below that, see, you will have plasma cells. Okay, you will have plasma cells and also lymphoid cells. So this is how you divide the three zones in histopathology. And if you're writing a short note on chancroid, you have to mention these three zones in biopsy. Okay, uh, this is known as presumptive diagnosis and it's a list given by CDC. And in order to make a diagnosis of chancroid on a presumption, that means without doing any test for chancroid, you can make it if all the four points are met. What are those four points? The first point is that it's more than one painful genital ulcers. It should have a one or more than one painful genital ulcer. The key is painful. The second is the clinical presentation ulcers, regional lymph neuropathy should be clinically typical for chancroid. That means ulcer should be present. Clinically, it should look like chancroid or behave like chancroid. There should be no evidence of syphilis either by serological test or by NAAT or by dark field illumination microscopy. And this should be there at least seven days after onset of ulcers. That means the test should be negative after seven days of ulcer. For example, you develop an ulcer at day zero. Then you have to and you do the test at day eight. That test for syphilis should be negative. The fourth point is that NAT for herpes simplex virus or a culture for HSV should be negative. So repeat after me. Four points for presumptive diagnosis. First is it should have one or more than one painful ulcers. Second would be that the clinical presentation would be typical for chancroid. Third would be no evidence of syphilis after seven days of ulcer onset. 
and the fourth is no evidence of genital herpes. Clear? This, this is presumptive diagnosis CDC for chancroid. Now, whenever you are discussing differentials about different STIs, you have to divide into two parts. Sexually transmitted infections, differential diagnosis and non-STI differentials. So, STI differentials include primary syphilis. Here, the lesion is known as chancre or a heart chancre. The genital herpes ulcer, granuloma inguinal or donovanosis, LGV, lymphogranuloma venereum or candidal balinopostitis which can present as linear erosions, linear ulcers with phimosis, and with phimosis predominantly. The non-STI differentials include traumatic ulcers, fixed drug eruption and malignancy. So that's what I said, biopsy is important if you're trying to rule out a malignancy differential. Okay, so repeat after me, STI differential, non-STI differential, STI differential are the causes of genital ulcers, primary syphilis, genital herpes, donovanosis, LGV, candidal balinitis. Non-STI differentials are traumatic ulcers, FDE and malignancy like SCC. Okay, let's move forward. Now, HIV co-infection. Whenever you are writing a short note or any STI, you have to mention few lines about the effect of that STI on HIV transmission and the effect of HIV on that STI. So, for chancro chancroid for HIV means what does chancroid do for HIV? It increases the transmission by 50 to 300 times. Okay. The eroded mucosa, the mucosa which is because of the ulcer it has eroded, can provide a good entry point for HIV. It also increases HIV susceptible cells. Now remember that the inflammation is predominantly because of lymphocytes. The CD4, CD8 positive lymphocytes. And these are those lymphocytes which are infected by HIV. So what happens is you have an ulcer. If I, if I just draw it here, you have an ulcer. And at the base of the ulcer, you have a lot of CD4 positive, CD8 positive lymphocytes. So what happens is if HIV comes, let's say this is HIV, if HIV comes, it is readily, it is easily able to infect those lymphocytes. And that is why the transmission of HIV increases if you have a chancroidal ulcer. Now what does HIV does do for chancroid? It increases the incubation period of chancroid. There can be multiple ulcers, okay, multiple ulcers. The healing might be delayed. The treatment will be slow or in fact not at all work. Okay, so you always have to mention what does the what does that STI do for HIV and what does HIV does do for the STI. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so we have discussed the clinical features of chancroid. We have discussed how the patient will present, what are the complications, what are the complications you will see when uh, it is uh, the HIV infection is also present. We have discussed that. So let's go with treatment. Whenever you are discussing treatment for STI, you have to discuss what does the CDC say, what does the NICO say, what does the W, what does WHO say? Okay. So what does CDC say? What does NICO say? What does WHO say? So with that, we'll start with the CDC guidelines for the treatment of chancroid. Remember that untreated chancroid might spontaneously resolve within one to three months. The ulcer that we are talking about, the ulcer and the bubo. Remember that 50% bubo resolves spontaneously uh, or without any sequelae. So, and that can happen that uh, an untreated infection might resolve in one to three months spontaneously. So, CDC guideline mentions four drugs, azithromycin, ceftriaxone, erythromycin and ciprofloxacin. So, the drug of choice or not drug of choice, but the first drug that CDC mentioned is azithromycin 1 gram orally as a single stat dose, as a single dose azithromycin. Second is ceftriaxone 250 milligram intramuscular dose, single dose. Erythromycin 500 milligram three times a day for a week for seven days and ciprofloxacin 500 milligram twice a day for three days. And CDC always prefers a single dose regimen. Okay, because CDC has to take care of the whole population. So, single dose is easy. You give one dose and you're okay with it. Okay. So, so uh, repeat after me. Four drugs. First drug is azithromycin, one gram single dose. Second is ceftriaxone, 250 milligram intramuscular injection, one dose. Then erythromycin, 500 milligram TDS for a week. And then ciprofloxacin, 500 milligram BD for three days. 
Improvement is seen in about one to two weeks, but the lymphadenopathy responds slowly and may require incision and drainage if the buber formation has happened. So if there is significant necrosis at the center, it might require incision and drainage of the abscess. Treat all partners presumptively if they are exposed within the 10 days of onset of ulcer. Okay, so let's say if, uh, if uh, a person has an ulcer at day 0, if there is any kind of unprotected contact with any other person in the last 10 days of the onset of ulcer, treat them with a single dose of azithromycin. Okay, so these are the CDC guidelines. Azithromycin, ceftriaxone, erythromycin, ciprofloxacin, easily. Okay, what does the European guideline say? So, European guidelines say, these are the 2015 guidelines. The first line is azithromycin or ceftriaxone, any of the, these two. The second line is erythromycin or ciprofloxacin, any of these two. The only difference is that it recommends erythromycin base four times a day for seven days. That's the only difference. So instead of here, instead of here three times a day, you have four times a day in European guidelines while using erythromycin base. Clear? So we have discussed CDC guidelines, we have discussed European guidelines. The NACO goes more towards the syndromic management. And why? Because NACO is, you know, uh, it's majorly focusing on AID, uh, HIV and AIDS. And that is why the syndromic management, uh, the focus is more on syndromic management and treating the patient as soon as they reach a healthcare provider. So the, the kits that you have to uh, look at is kit number three and kit number four. Kit number three is white, like the color of penicillin that we give for syphilis. And kit number four is blue. And the way that we were taught, uh, we were told to remember is that when a person is allergic to penicillin, allergic to penicillin, if you give penicillin, the person will land into cyanosis, become blue. That's how we used to remember. So white, like penicillin, and blue because of cyanosis of penicillin. So that's how we used to remember the color of kits. So kit number three is when you have a syphilitic ulcer or an ulcer in which you suspect it to be because of syphilis. So you give benzathine penicillin along with azithromycin. Benzathine penicillin will cover syphilis. Azithromycin will cover chancroid. Okay. If the person is allergic to penicillin, you give doxycycline 100 mg two times a day. This covers LGV and azithromycin. This, this also covers syphilis also. Syphilis and azithromycin 1 gram single dose. This covers chancroid okay chancroid is also covered by doxycycline the another the alternative regimen for chancroid is doxycycline 100 milligram twice a day for a week but because you require two weeks for lgv and syphilis it's better to uh, come club it with them okay so that uh, i hope it makes it clear any person presenting with genital ulcer single or multiple painful or painless with burning sensation in the genital area or enlarged lymph nodes you decide one of these two kits Either if you suspect syphilis to be the cause of organism, go for uh, penicillin or kit 3. And if the patient is allergic to syphilis, go for kit 4, the one with the doxycycline. So remember that azithromycin in these kits is the drug for chancroid. Okay. So these are the NACO or the syndromic management of genital ulcers. If the patient is pregnant, then ciprofloxacin becomes a good choice because there is low risk to fetus, but there is uh, an, a chance of toxicity during breastfeeding. So make sure you keep that in mind. Erythromycin base is safe. Now remember, remember that erythromycin mesylate, which is usually available as the salt, is not used because of hepatotoxicity. So because of liver damage, this is not used. Erythromycin base is used, which is safe. Otherwise, there is no adverse effect of chancroid on pregnancy, on the outcome of pregnancy. But we have to treat it with erythromycin or ciprofloxacin. In children, if there are lesions of chancroid, and, and I'm saying it as, you know, documented lesion of chancroid, that means the diagnosis is confirmed, you have a culture as a gold standard, then it might be an indication or an evidence of abuse. Okay. And involvement of other areas like lower limbs are seen in yours endemic regions. Okay, so in children, you have to be, be more careful if you see genital ulcers of chancroid. Now, you need to call the patient after one week. 
to look at the follow up response of the ulcer you have to ensure that the resolution of infection has happened that means the ulcer is healing you have to look at the amount of healing if the healing is slow suspect hiv you have to document any treatment failure if there is no response to those ulcer healing suspect hiv or any other cause of immunodeficiency look at uh, antibiotic resistance or any reinfection treat the partners if the ulcer is not healing you have to look at other causes of anogenital ulcers you have to evaluate the reports for example screening has to be done for hep b you know hep c vdrl tpha hiv all of these reports are advised to the patient on first visit you have to look at the results of these reports and any other concerns that the patient might have so patient might say that if the ulcer is healed am i still infectious you know these kind of concerns should be answered and make sure you treat the patient within uh, patient's partner within 10 days of exposure to those ulcer so this is how the, the, you have to go about follow up of any sti cases now uh, variants now these variants are mentioned there are there are many variants of chancroid we'll just go through them we'll just read about it so that we can say something in the viva or in the short notes but they are not that important because chancroid itself is very rarely seen you might not be able to see those variants as such but it's a good idea to keep those variants in mind so that uh, any uncommon presentation of chancroid is also not uh, is also taken into account so dwarf chancroid in which you have more than one herpetiform ulcers like a small you know multiple ulcers like a herpetic ulcer plus you have inguinal lymphadenopathy so these are dwarf chancroid or small chancroids giant chancroid starts as a small ulcer but extends very rapidly with significant destruction okay in transient chancroid the ulcer resolves very rapidly within four to six days now ulcer might resolve spontaneously in one to three months but if it resolves within four to six days it's known as a transient chancroid and after resolution of ulcer you can then develop uh, you can then see an acute inguinal lymphadenitis as a, as a presentation by the patient because the ulcer resolves so quickly and this can easily be confused with lgv so you have to keep that in mind in follicular chancroid the involvement is of the pilar apparatus or the hair uh, around the pubic areas might be involved in follicular chancroid in phagedenic chancroid now phage means to eat that means there is so much widespread necrosis with extensive destruction that looks like a chunk of tissue has been eaten out so that is phagedenic chancroid Pseudogranuloma inguinal, which looks like uh, ulcer of granuloma inguinal. We'll discuss that further when we'll be discussing granuloma inguinal. Okay. Serpiginous chancroid, that means in which you have multiple ulcers arranged in a snake like fashion or serpiginous fashion, serpiginous pattern, a snake like pattern. So that is known as serpiginous chancroid. Mixed chancroid means a soft and a hard chancre. That means you have infection by Haemophilus ducre along with Trypanema pallidum, which is syphilis. So we have two, two genital ulcers in the same patient. A chancroidal ulcer. What is chancroidal? So chancre is syphilis, chancroid is H. ducre, and chancroidal means some, uh, some genital ulcer which looks like chancroid but it is caused by organisms other than hemophilus ducai so you will have a tender non-indurated single large ulcer which is the same as a chancroid but there will be a conspicuous absence of lymphadenopathy remember that lymphadenopathy occurs in 30 to 60 percent of cases but there will be absence of this lymphadenopathy in a chancroidal ulcer which is caused by organisms other than h ducai clear let's move so with that, we finished this discussion on chancroid. We'll be making videos every week on different STIs. Uh, these are shorter STIs. We don't usually encounter them uh, that commonly in our clinics, especially if you are practicing, you know, in private center, uh, centers. You might be, you might uh, never come across a chancroid, especially when the incidence is so low. So these are some reading recommendations. Chapter 42 from uh, book Sexually Transmitted Infections by Gupta S. Kumar B. et al. Uh, this is a stat pulse article for chancroid 
सीडीसी uh, गाइडलाइंस आर इंपॉर्टेंट निको गाइडलाइंस आर इंपॉर्टेंट सो दीज टू गाइडलाइंस आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर योर वाइवा और अकेडमिक पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू यू नीड टू नो देम दीज आर दू आर एल सो यू कैन इजिली गो दे इफ दे आर फ्रीली अवेलेबल ऑन द इंटरनेट गो थ्रू देम रीड देम यू शुड मेमोराइज द ट्रीटमेंट प्रोटोकॉल्स फॉर सीडीसी एंड द प्रोटोकॉल्स फॉर सिंड्रोमिक मैनेजमेंट फ्रॉम निको so these are the two reading uh, reading recommendations from my side ctc guidelines and the nico guidelines ctc guidelines might be updated in few maybe next year or something like that so when the update is available i'll make another video on that so with that we'll finish uh, this video and we have finished the first lecture on sti starting with shankaroid you may write to me uh, as an email in on my id this is my id or you can just comment your doubts or any kind of suggestion or queries on what all you want to know if there are any other topics regarding or related to shankaroid which i have not covered just let me know i'll answer the answer these in the comments otherwise this video is has everything that you need to know about shankaroid in order to write a short note if you go through this video once or twice you will be easily able to remember uh, about shankaroid that's the primary motive the secondary motive is to know about shankaroid so that it is not missed in the opd setting with that i'll finish this video and i will meet next week with another sti till then bye bye and enjoy your weekend tada